Praise the Lord. Well, let's go over to James chapter number 1, moving on to the next section of James 1. <laughs> Let me get my notes called up here. Y'all were worried about me not having a clock. There is one on my, on my tablet here. So... <laughs> I just can't find what I'm looking for right now. There it is. Okay. So we're going to start with verse 12 tonight. We ended with verse 11 last week. One of the great challenges that, that we will have as long as we live in this world is dealing with temptation. Uh, it's just a, a part of life, and, and we deal with temptation. Uh, it, it can be frustrating sometimes to know that your sin has been forgiven but yet constantly or maybe not constantly but frequently enough find yourself bombarded by temptation to sin uh, and, and I you know I don't want to be one of those people that just says well Grace is so amazing because it covers everything in my past and everything in my future, and so it doesn't matter what I do. Uh, no, I, I can't reconcile that viewpoint with the New Testament. You know there are folks who believe that, that Christ, once you accepted Christ, He forgave all your sins future and all your sins past, and so nothing else that you do in the body counts against you. Uh, I say read the New Testament and, and tell me, how men like James and Paul could write the things that they did if, uh, if they knew all their future sin was already forgiven. Uh, but tonight we're going to look at what James has to say. He gives a promise, and then he gives a caution, and then he tries to help us understand. So he gives a caution and a promise, and he tries to help us understand. So we're going to start with verse number 12. Uh, as... I'm sorry, verse 12 says, A man who endures trials is blessed. <laughs> That's not the word that we think of, enduring trials. But James says, A man who endures trials is blessed because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So the crown of life we know is something that comes in uh, in eternity. It's not something that's awarded to us now. So reading between the lines, it's a little bit. You have to infer that James is saying trials are not going to end. As long as we're above ground, we're going to continue to have trials. But you need to already reckon yourself to be blessed. Reckon yourself already. Think of yourself already to be blessed. That word Blessed uh, is, is truly means to be happy. When you boil it down to and you get your dictionary out, and, your, your, your Bible dictionary out and, and, and search that word down, it, makarios in Greek means to be happy. So he's saying a man who endures trials is happy. <laughs> I, that takes an action of your of your of your self will. You have to, because I you know folks, I, I I'm almost fifty. Some of y'all have more years on on the calendar than that, and you know as well as I do that when you're going through a trial, it's happy is not often the thing that you think of. But we have to <laughs> we have to reckon ourselves. We have to reckon ourselves, this is not going to last. Even if it should stay with me the rest of my natural life, it's got a termination date. It's got an end date. It will not go with me past, you know, past my last breath. I'm going, as Paul would say, the, the glory that is set before us so far outweighs the things that we're dealing with in, in this life that we can set them behind us and say they're just, I count them as loss uh, for, the, for the exceeding glory of the calling of Christ Jesus. That's why I say, and I truly mean it, 
I, I don't understand how folks who don't have a hope in the resurrection deal with the world, deal with, with life. And, and I, I don't think they do very well. I think that's why there's, there's so much uh, perversion and, and wickedness out there. I think that's why, uh, you know, on, on, and I'm exaggerating, but on nearly every corner, there's a drive through liquor store, you know, uh, because people don't deal with it and they try to self-medicate and drown it and, and that's why the drug problems are as high as they are. But we can know that our help is not found in Jim Beam, our help is not found in a, a bottle of pills, our help is not found, I'm talking about our ultimate help. You all know that medication has its place and, and is used by God. I understand that. What I'm talking about are those who self-medicate and try to get high or get drunk or get stoned or whatever and, and self-medicate to deal like a couple of weeks ago, Rhonda had a really bad day on a Wednesday, and uh, her boss told her she needed to go home and, and have a few glasses of wine and come back in a better mood the next day. And that's the thought of the world. We don't have to go and get that, that wine that makes you drunk because we have the new wine that comes from the Lord God Almighty. But it takes a mentality of the Christian to say, I have decided to follow Jesus, though none go with me, still I will follow. I have determined that I will set my sights on things above and not on things below. I have decided that whatsoever things are good, that's what I'm going to think on. I'm going to meditate on the goodness of God while it is today. For after, says there in verse 12, afterwards, when you pass the test, you receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Folks, what a day that's going to be when our Jesus we finally get to see and, and we become like him. All the temptations and all the trials and all the hardships will one day be past. It'll all be over. It'll all be settled. It'll all be done while we're here. And we're going to get into this more. But thank God it's not just about our willpower that helps us overcome temptation. But it does, it, it, it is part of the solution is you've got to have a mindset, you know, that I don't have to give in to this. There's better things than this. There's a, God's got a better plan for me than this. So you know as well as I do, it's the power of the cross. It's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ working through us. It's, it's the Holy Ghost, our comforter, who gives us the ability to absolutely say no to the temptations and to overcome those things. But God doesn't overwhelm our mind, does he? He doesn't take control of us like a, a puppeteer pulling our strings. We have to make up our mind. So that's why James writes that, I believe. Then look at verse 13. He says, no one who is undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. Don't blame God <laughs> for the temptations that come in our life. We know the tempter is the evil one. We know the tempter is the one who is working against us, and now I, I've held on to this for years, for, for over 20 years, since the first time I remember hearing it. What God allows into our life, what the devil wants to do to us, God, when we're walking in faith and doing our best to live in relationship with God, then the things that come our way, the Father has to allow them in right? Because we're living under the blood. We're living under the protection of Christ. So the temptations, the trials that do come in, they're filtered through the Father, just like with Job when God said, okay, I'll allow you. I'll allow you to do this, but, but no further. I'll allow you. When something happens, the Father doesn't do it but he does allow the enemy to bring that temptation into our life, not to destroy us, not to drive us down, not, uh, not even necessarily as a punishment to us, but it is a trial. It is a test. Teachers don't just teach the kids in school. I don't think it's changed that much. I think they still have 
trials. I think they still have tests that they have to, to take ever so often. I'm sure they're completely different from what your test and my test were like. But, but they teach a material, and then they say, oh, now the trial is coming. On Friday, you've got to come in here and close your book, and, and I'm going to give you an exam to see whether you have learned the material or not. And so, Folks, when God allows these things in our life, it is not to drive us down. It's not to destroy us. It's to build our faith. It's to show us things. It is to, uh, to teach us things. It, it's so that we'll climb a little higher and shuck off some more of this world uh, and, and draw a little closer to Him. God's not tempted by evil, and so He doesn't tempt anyone to do evil. I heard someone say... Uh, who had studied much more deeply into Islam than I have, that, the, that their holy book presents this idea of Allah who sometimes does good things and sometimes does bad things. And, and he's not always one way or the other. Sometimes he does bad things to people. Sometimes he does good things to people. I can't testify that that is true. I've never studied it myself. But I am glad to be able to testify today and tell you there is nothing bad, there is nothing evil, there is nothing about God that is not holy and pure and righteous. He is altogether good all of the time, and he never has anything else enter into his way of thinking. So we don't want to be deceived into thinking that God is doing bad things to us. Look at, I'm going to jump down to verse 16. Don't be deceived, James says, my dearly, loved, my dearly loved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, <clears throat> coming down from the Father of light. With Him there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. Look at verse 18. By his own choice, he gave us a new birth by the message of truth so that we would be the first fruits of his creature, of his creatures. What's all that saying, Pastor? God is the source <clears throat> of all that is good, not of evil. Evil comes about by choosing the opposite of what God desires and what God wants. Satan is the author of confusion. He's the author of all the sin and the evil in this world, and it all came about. You've read your Bible. It came about because he said, I will lift myself up. I will go against God. I will make my throne higher than God's throne. I will, I will, I will. And, uh, and, and that led to his pride, led to his downfall. God's the source of good. God has never done me anything but good. I am so glad when I came to understand more, more fully this idea of a God who is merciful and gracious. Because I spent uh, my first couple of decades uh, believing in a God that was just ready to smash me under his thumb, rub me out, bang his heavenly gavel on my head, <laughs> that a God who was just angry and hard to please and, and a, a hard taskmaster. But the more I learned and the more I studied the Word of God, and the more I listened to the voice of the Holy Spirit, God does judge. There is a chastening that comes from God, absolutely. But chastening that comes from God is not evil. It's not, it's not evil. And, and God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. And He's a God of grace unto us. He says right there, I love that verse number 18, where, where James says, by God's own choice, he gave us a new birth by the gospel hmm. so that we would be the first fruits of his creation. Oh, man. One of my very favorite verses in the whole Bible is right there uh, in verse number 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of light, with whom is no variableness at all, neither shadow of turning. Oh, I love that verse. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from God. 
Now, he says that in juxtaposition to his previous statement that says, don't think when evil things are happening that God is their source, that God is causing those evil things to happen because good and perfect things come down from God. He's never even considered. (laughs) I know maybe this is basic theology to those that are here on a Wednesday night, but our God, God... uh, in heaven has never even considered doing evil it doesn't enter his thought process he has he doesn't have to convince himself to do what is right god is good all the time and he says there by his own choice when we were yet in sin he offered us the gospel so that we could be the first fruits of his creation. What does that mean? He's talking about salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast, but it is faith in the good news of Jesus Christ. We just simply believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came to this earth and died in our place, that His death paid for our sin, that He died that he not only died, but he was resurrected and he lives forever. If we will believe the good news, the gospel message, that's salvation. Oh, it can't be that easy. It can't be that easy. I've got to give money. I've got to do works. No, it's that easy. It's believe the gospel of truth. And now, don't you know that God in heaven could have made it hard to be saved? Oh, absolutely. He could have made it extremely difficult extremely costly, but he made it so easy that anyone, anyone can afford to be, salv- to, to be saved from those that are living in a mud hut in a jungle somewhere uh, to those that are living in, in a high-rise uh, apartment building uh, in, the, in the penthouse. Salvation is simply a gift of God through faith in, our, in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I like what, uh, what, what Peter said says in 1 Peter 1, he says, By obedience to the truth, having purified yourself for sincere love of the brothers, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Verse 23 says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. How did that happen, Peter? It happened through the living and enduring Word of God. Wow. Through the Word, we are born again to life imperishable. (laughs) Yeah. What a wonderful scripture that is. Through the Word. It is the Word of God that saves us and keeps us and gives us hope of heaven when this life is over. The Word is true. The Word is our promise. The Word is our foundation. The Word died for us. Isn't that what the Scripture says? John says the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It was the incarnate, the embodied Word, Jesus, who took our cross, took our sins, died in our place, and gives us salvation through faith in His finished work what a wonderful thought so how could a God that is that loving that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what believeth on him should not perish how could a God of 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 love be even that loved us that much and he did all of that before anybody turned to Christ as Savior. As the Scripture says, while we were yet in our sins, He died for us. Huh. How could a God like that be thought of as a God who does bad things to people? I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. I don't think that you all have those thoughts. Maybe somebody who's watching has some bad uh, theology in your background, but God is good all the time. And so that is the caution. Don't think, yes, bad things happen, he says in, in, in verse uh, 12. That's the promise. And we've got a, a lot to look forward to. Then in verses 13 
At 16, 17, and 18, he cautions us to remember how good God is. And now jump back up to verse 14. He wants to help us understand. He says in verse 14, each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Y'all remember Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it, right? <laughs> He's drawn away by his own evil desires. So James says there's two things at work here. There's desires, or as the King James says, lust. There's lust, and, and that word lust, I think we automatically, Travis is guilty of automatically hooking that up to a sexual thing. But it just means a strong desire. A strong desire. It doesn't have to be sexual. To lust after something. It just to have a strong desire for it. And then there's being drawn away and enticed. What is the enticement? An enticement is an opportunity to satisfy your desire. So... If you put it in the forms of a mathematical equation, temptation equals lust or desire plus opportunity. Because we really can't be tempted if something's impossible, right? If it, if it isn't within the realm of possibility, th then it can't be a temptation for us. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, it's got to be able to at least to be able to be imagined so we have to have the opportunity you know it, we have to have the opportunity to to do so uh, so think of it like this a small boy his mom's made some fresh cookies and and uh, you know put them they, they've cooled and she's put them in the cookie jar and she's told him none until after supper none until after supper those are for later but he's tempted right he's tempted why is he tempted because he wants some of those cookies. So he knows that mom is off in the laundry room uh, putting a load of clothes in the washing machine. He knows that she's going to take a few minutes to do that. And so now he has the opportunity. Temptation, the desire, I want some of mama's chocolate chip cookies. And now I've got the opportunity to have them. That's, that, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, so remember... Remember, it's not a sin to be tempted. Jesus himself was tempted. So, and he was without sin, so it can't be a sin to be tempted of something. Uh, the, you know, we know that story. Jesus is baptized by John, and he goes into the wilderness being uh, driven, as I believe Mark says, it being driven by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness. And there he fasts. And at the end of his, of his fasting, the devil comes to him and tempts him three times. He tempts him with food because he's been fasting. And then, uh, then he tempts him to prove that God's true to his word. And then he tempts him, thirdly, to uh, bow down and take the shortcut. You've come to take a kingdom. If you'll just worship me, I'll just go ahead and give it to you right now. Because all these kingdoms are under my authority. Right? So he tempted Jesus three times in that story, and yet he was without sin. Uh, the writer of Hebrews tells us that he, was a, that he is our great high priest and that he was tempted uh, in all manner uh, like we are. So the Lord, you know, I know some people want to get into a debate here. It wasn't possible for Jesus to have sinned. Well, if it wasn't possible, he couldn't have been tempted that's what I'm saying with that equation. It has to be possible before we can be tempted of something. And so, yes, I believe that it was, anyway, that, that's a whole deep theology that we can't really dive off into. But just read it at, at face value. You know, don't try to confuse yourself or don't let somebody confuse you. Just take it at face value. It says the devil tempted him. Just take the word of God at the word. Take him at his word, right? So, uh Hebrews 4 and 15, we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with us, but one who was tested or tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin. 
So the first stage is something tempts us, and nothing wrong has happened yet. We've just been tempted by something, you know? There's always that petty cash in there in the office, and nobody ever checks it, and it's a temptation. Oh, you know, there's nobody watching right now. I bet I could just drive off from this gas pump. (laughs) Whatever, whatever. The temptation. I bet nobody would notice if I just slipped this in my pocket while I'm walking through Meyer and, and just head on out to the car. The temptation. The temptation, whatever it may look like, and you can, you know, it can be a million different things. The temptation itself, just because a tempting thought comes, doesn't mean that we've sinned. All right, so keep that, please keep that in mind, because the second stage is the development of sin itself. Look at verse 15. After desire is conceived, you think that thought and you let it dwell there. You began thinking on it and scheming on it and imagining how you could get away with it, how you could do it, and, and, and uh, uh, imagining, uh, uh, imagining it out, dreaming it out, planning it out. Once it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Spiritual death cutting us off, separating us from the Father, and eventually eternal death if it's not dealt with. Mm. Where does it all start? It all starts with a thought in the mind. That's uh, years ago. I haven't read it in a long time, but uh, years ago uh, we went through as a, as a Sunday school class this book by uh, Joyce Meyer called Battlefield of the Mind. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think it's a great book that talks about your thought life and, and how, you know, how powerful your thoughts are. And while you can't tell yourself, I'm not going to think about such and such because you'll automatically think about it, you know. If I were to say, don't you dare think about red elephants, well, pfft, I never would have until you said that, you know. But we can replace those thoughts with the things that we do want to think about. And train our mind to think on these things, as the Scripture says. Temptation leads to sin only when you yield to it and act upon it. And now that action, according to Jesus, doesn't mean that you actually have to go through a physical act, right? Because Jesus said, you look on a woman and lust after her in your heart, You've committed sin. Huh. Well, pastor, how does that mesh up with what you just said about temptation doesn't mean sin? Jesus didn't just say, if you look at a woman and are tempted, did he? He's talking about somebody that has thought that thing out. They've ruminated that and lusted after her in their mind and, and spent some time in a, in a fantasy. I don't mean to be overboard, but... It's not just the fleeting thought. It's not just the fleeting thought that the flesh or the devil puts in our head. It's when we mar- well, let it marinate. My, my granddad used to say, I, I love him, uh, and I'm sure it wasn't original with him, but my granddad used to say frequently in his preaching, it's one thing for you to let a bird land on your head, but it's another thing altogether for you to let him build a nest there. You know, We can't control the thought that pops in, but we don't have to let it stay there in Jesus Christ. We can take authority over our thought life and cast that stuff down before we ruminate, marinate, and think about it, and 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 let our minds go crazy with the uh, that. That's uh, you know, the same could be said uh, about uh, not just a sexual sin, but the same could be said about being so mad at somebody that you just want to kill them, and, and then you you start thinking about. Ways that you could actually do it and, and marinate, ruminate. That's awfully close to the same thing as the man lusting after a woman in his mind. We've got to be careful to take those thoughts into captivity. Sin, therefore, requires some type of action. Mental action or physical action that 
I hope I'm not being confusing. I hope you understand where I'm going with this. Sin equals, put that next one up, desire plus opportunity plus action. Then it becomes sin. That's why it's so important that we stay in control of our mind uh, because we might have, you know, we might have that moment uh, where we have the thought that I'm just going to let my tongue go. I'm fixing to tear into you. We have that thought, but in the power of the Holy Ghost, we arrest that thought. We stop ourselves and we never say it. And maybe we've had the thought. Maybe we even say, Lord, forgive me of that thought, but we don't let it come flying out of our mouths. How much easier is it then to, there's no mess to clean up, is there? Because we didn't say those hurtful words. Boy, but if we don't put that Holy Ghost guard on our mouth and the thought comes in and we think, I'm going to get you now for what you just did or what you said, and we use our tongue to cut somebody and we say those words, we may get under conviction of the Holy Spirit five seconds later and go back and try to apologize. But it's awfully hard to put those feathers back in the pillow, right? Y'all know that story uh, the, the, the guy who his neighbor told all kinds of, the pastor, he was a pastor, and his neighbor told all kinds of, of bad stories about him around town and just, just ruined his uh, reputation. And so he resigned his church, and he was packing up, getting ready to move on to another town. And the neighbor came by and was just in tears and said, Oh, I have just discovered that all those things I said about you were false. And I'm so sorry, would you please forgive me? And he said, well, yeah, I forgive you, but I, I, want, you, I want you to do me a favor. Go right over there and pick up that pillow. She went over and picked up the pillow and brought it to him. He took his pocket knife and he cut the seam. He said, now take the end of that pillow and just fluff it up in the air like this. And so she did, and it was a down pillow, and feathers just went everywhere. And he said, now then. I want you to go and gather up all those feathers and restuff that pillow so my wife can sew it back up. Oh, I can't do that. The wind has scattered them hither and thither. And he said, that's the power of your tongue. I have forgiven you, and if you've asked God, he's forgiven you, but the effects of your words will never be able to go back in the pillow. We can get forgiveness. God gives forgiveness, but sometimes the actions the results of our sins, sometimes God doesn't uproot the crop, right? Sometimes we still have to deal with the negative aspects of the sin uh, even though we've been forgiven for it. Okay, let me move on. I think y'all understand what I'm coming from with that. I'm, let me see what time it is. I got a few more minutes left. And he says the final stage in this is death. In verse number 15, Romans 6 and 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Re uh, Revelation 21 and 8, all cowards and unbelievers, the vile, murderers, sexual immor sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So desire plus opportunity plus action without forgiveness results in punishment. Sin without forgiveness results in, results in the punishment that comes from God. Because God is just, because God is holy, sin cannot exist in His presence. And He gives us all the opportunity of a free forgiveness in this life. But if we act on our sins and we do not come seeking forgiveness of the Father, James says, as does John the Revelator and as does Paul, there is a judgment that will come and we must pay the penalty for those sins because the blood of Christ has not washed them away from us. So how do we overcome uh, sin in, in just the, the last couple of minutes here. We overcome sin by asking God to change our desires. One of my dearly beloved uh, mentors that's already gone on to heaven, he used to love to say to people who'd never heard it before, he'd love to say, you know, 
Since I got saved, I still smoke as much as I want to and drink as much as I want to and party and, and dance as much as I want to, but the difference is Jesus changed my want to. <laughs> I don't want to do that stuff anymore. Romans 12 and 1 says that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice and don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's talking about changing your desires. Galatians 5 says we are to crucify our flesh with the passions and desires thereof. So we pray, oh Lord, change me. Make me be acceptable unto you. Give me a heart like yours, oh God. We let the Word do its work on us. We let the Holy Spirit do His work on us. Our, word, our desire is changed by the Word of God. Our desires will be changed by the Word of God. You don't believe me? Let me throw you a couple of scriptures as we, as we close out our time. Psalm 119 and 11. The psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? So I might not sin against you. The word of God has the power to transform our desires as we eat the Word of God, as we study it and chew on it and, and, and meditate on it and get it inside of us, get it in our head and then let it soak on down to our hearts so we don't only know it, but we also believe it, that will change our desires. That will change our desires. Uh, as you read, like I told you earlier, I struggled uh, up through my 20s with this idea of a God who was just never happy with me. And I never felt like I could operate in the Spirit. I never felt like I could hope to be a pastor or, or, to, or to do any kind of serious work for God because I was always messing up too much. I never could get my life in line. And God was always unhappy with me. But as I studied more, you see, I'm not blaming that on my parents. I'm not blaming that on my preachers. I'm not blaming that on anybody but me. I had a wrong understanding of God. As I studied more and dug into the Word of God for myself and thought about and looked up definitions and, and, and ran cross-references and really dug into the Word of God, I began to see God's long-suffering and God's patience and God's mercy and God's grace and my desires began to change. And it will work. If it worked for me, it will work for you. God changed my desires. The second thing is, God, we work with God to limit our opportunities. Temptation takes both desire and opportunity, so if we can work on work with God through the Word and the Holy Ghost about changing our desires, then we need to limit our opportunities to fulfill those desires. As an old saying is, uh, I don't, Smoke or chew or run around with girls who do. <laughs> we limit our opportunities for sin. Jesus said, pray like this. Do not deliver us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Right? Jesus said, guys, stay awake and pray so that you don't enter into temptation the spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. So we can cooperate with God by avoiding situations that might cause us to want to sin. I've told you before, so I'll tell it very briefly. A guy under my ministry early on uh, came to Christ because of the prayers of his wife and his grandmother, and he was an alcoholic. So he changed the way he drove home from work because he didn't want to drive by the package store that he always stopped at to get his six-pack or whatever he was buying on the way home. He changed and went home a different way to avoid that source of temptation until he knew that he was stronger in the Lord. Sometimes we've got to change the way we go home, right? Sometimes we have to avoid the temptation, uh, avoiding people whose evil behavior encourages us to sin because 1 Corinthians 15 and 33 says, do not be deceived, bad company corrupts good character. All right, I'm probably out of time. Yep, I'm going to stop right there.
So, uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to study your word tonight. Change our desires, O oh God. Let us desire what you desire. Use the word and the Holy Spirit to mold us and make us into the men and women that you would have us to be. God, some of us have lived for you a long time. We've, we've studied and we've been through the Word, and Lord, we, we know. But God, I'm asking you to take us on to even deeper water. Lord, work on getting even more of the flesh out of our lives and let us be even more led by the Spirit than we ever have been before. Help us to avoid areas and times of temptation. Deliver us not into evil, but deliver us from Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you for being here.